Council Chair and participants, we are now live. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. This is a meeting of the special committee dealing with the Department of Human Services and uh, children. Um, I am going to read a statement that is required, so bear with me. It is uh, an important statement. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently uh, uh, are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of city council meetings are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Clerk, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance, will you please indicate that you are present when your name is called? Also, please say a few words when responding so that your image will display on screen when you speak. I will note, however, that I am also already aware that one of our members, Judge Paul Panapinto, is not available. We will call his name. And also that my co-chair, Councilman Cindy Bass, is traveling and has some Wi-Fi issues. She is listening and participating. Um, and so I know she is on, but probably cannot respond. So with that, Clerk, would you please call the roll? Uh, Richard Wexler. Uh, and just a reminder to our members to unmute your microphone and then remute. Okay, let's try that again. Thank you. I'm Richard Wexler. I'm executive director of the National Coalition for Child Protection Reform and a member of the special committee. And I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be here today. Uh, Nadim Bazar. Good afternoon, Nadim Bazar. Uh, and I'm looking forward to today's hearing. Thank you. Robin Cooper. Okay. Uh, Sheriff Rochelle Blau. Uh, Vicki Suarez. You're on mute, Ms. Suarez. We still cannot hear you. There will be an icon with a microphone crossed out. How's that? Yes, there you are. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm Vicki Suarez, Parental Rights, Pennsylvania. I'm here to uh, help in any way I can to uh, to save parents and children and protect the family. Thank you. Thank you. Brianna Donahue. Hello, I'm Brianna. I'm part of the special committee. Thank you. And uh, Councilman, as you mentioned, uh, we do not have Paul Panapinto. Um, and I don't believe, is Cindy Bass there yet? I don't believe so. Yeah, I spoke with Councilwoman Bass um, just prior to the call. She is traveling, she is tuning in, uh, but she does expect her Wi-Fi to go in and out. So, you know, she, she will be participating. Okay. All right, then that uh, concludes the role, Councilman. Thank you very much. Um, a quorum of the committee is present. Um, a quorum is not needed because this is an investigatory hearing but I am happy that uh, we have uh, the particip participation that we do. Uh, this is a public hearing of the Special Committee on Child Separation in Philadelphia regarding resolution number 190798. Clerk, will you please read the title of the resolution? Resolution 190798, authorizing the establishment of a Special Committee on Child Separations in Philadelphia to review child separation in Philadelphia's child welfare system and develop recommendations to ensure compliance with state child protective services law to protect children and due process rights of families and prevent the unnecessary breakup of families. 
Thank you. And I just got a text message from the co-chair. She is listening in. She is um, um, on the call. So thank you very much, uh, co-chairwoman, uh, Councilman Cindy Bass, uh, who, by the way, is the chair of public health for city council. Um, before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because of the hearing, uh, because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy by continuing uh, to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. I wanna ensure that everybody understands that there's an icon. Uh, it says show conversation. If you um, click on that, you will be able to uh, use the chat feature, which is the texting feature, the written feature. If you want to be recognized, if um, if you want to uh, um, for questions or other things like that, um, I will note that uh, another one of our members, Robin Cooper, uh, has just joined us. I will ask the clerk to call her name so, so she can be recognized. Robin Cooper, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I was looking for the link. Sorry for my lateness. No, thank you very much for your participation. Um, okay, very good. And could you just um, uh, and, and and we'll do this at a later time, but but uh, uh, could you just let um, the public know who you are? Hi, public. I am Robin Cooper. I am the president of Teamsters Local 502, which is the um, Commonwealth Association of School Administrators. So we work with the district. Thank you very much. You're okay, so um, at this time, I will ask the clerk um, to call the first panel of witnesses. The first panel is going to be Professor Cara Fink. Okay, and now I'm going to hand this over to uh, Richard Wexler for uh, the, any opening statement and to begin his questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Council Member Bass, Council Member O, members of the committee. For a number of reasons, many people had to change plans on short notice to make this meeting possible. So the first thing I want to do is thank you all for that. I very much appreciate it. I also want to thank Council Member O's staff and the staff of the Philadelphia City Council for making this meeting possible. Just before our witnesses begin, I want to briefly take note of some progress at Philadelphia DHS. Earlier this month, I listened to the quarterly meeting of the Child Welfare Oversight Board. Three things happened that were significant and I think encouraging. First, Commissioner Ali reported on entries into care for fiscal year 2020. Those entries were down from the year before, which were down from the year before that. Now, even with these figures, Philadelphia remains an outlier. Philadelphia still takes away children at a rate above the average for big cities and double the rate for New York and Chicago. But the trend at least now is in the right direction. Second, Commissioner Ali acknowledged that Philadelphia is an outlier and acknowledged that this is a serious problem. And third is the simple fact that these data were made public. Every other big city routinely has disclosed for decades how many children have been taken away by the Child Protective Services Agency over the course of a year. That has not always been the case in Philadelphia. This suggests that at long last, Philadelphia DHS is beginning to move in the right direction. I hope that this committee will be able to move DHS in that direction farther and faster. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Fink to make her statement. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Wexler. 
Professor Fink, good afternoon. You're connected and ready to proceed. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kara Fink, and I am currently a practice professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where I also direct the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary child advocacy clinic. And um, I want to start off by thanking uh, Councilman O, Councilwoman Bass, Richard Wexler, and the other members of the special committee for inviting me to speak today and commend you on all of the logistics and uh, technology that needs to happen to get us all together today. So thank you so much. Um, I want to start off by making clear that these comments and, and statements today are my own and are not reflective of the views or opinions of the University of Pennsylvania or the law school. Um, and I also want to lodge what I'm hoping to say and share with all of you today in this conversation, really in the experience that I've had, which is having worked for over a decade at the Bronx Defenders in New York City, where I created the family defense practice. And before that, serving youth uh, who were in foster care at an organization called The Door, also in New York City. Um, and now as the director of the Interdisciplinary Child Advocacy Clinic, where I represent both parents and young people involved in the child welfare system. And I want to give the caveat that while I am thrilled to speak about my experiences and to share some of my perspectives, that is by no means a replacement for speaking to the parents and youth who are involved in this system every day. And it is critical that their lived experience is first and foremost in all discussions when it comes to reform of this system. And for far too long, that has been an afterthought or a token. And I am encouraged and thrilled to see that that is not how this committee is proceeding. I would add that this is not only my opinion and perspective, but in fact, what has been put forth by the Children's Bureau in a memorandum dated of 1903, it is said from federal policy that you are encouraged as state and county agencies to solicit and use the lived experience of youth and parents. And I think if we have learned anything over the course of particularly this past year and the movements of social justice and rethinking all of our fundamentally some ways flawed systems, it is isn't exactly that, that we need to start listing more carefully and more closely to those who have actually experienced this system firsthand. I would add to that the experience of caseworkers who are on the front line doing this work and making incredibly difficult decisions. Um, I have often recognized my own privilege and luxury of uh, being able to see these cases at the other end when all of those hard decisions have been made and I don't wish to in any way discredit or diminish their role and importance in thinking about reform. So with that caveat, I will start with a couple of premises. I, I tried to think about how I wanted to structure this, particularly since as um, Councilman O noted, I did present testimony back in, it seems forever ago, but February of 2019. Um, and, and I don't wanna repeat, but I want to sort of perhaps share how my thinking about these issues have grown over the course of the past year and a half. And so I'd like to posit this as two truths and one proposal. So here's truth number one. Truth number one that I hope we can all agree on, and I would argue that this emerging science of neuroscience and psychology and development, child development, has also shown to be clear, is that removal is trauma. It may be necessary, it may be something we have to do in a very limited number of cases to protect the safety of a child, but it is traumatic even when it is necessary. It deeply, deeply and severely and profoundly impacts children for years. And not simply with emotional impact, but their medical outcomes, their health outcomes, their educational outcomes, their attachments to adults, their decision making, really on almost any metric that we would garner or gather success about how we're doing in a child welfare system, removal impacts that and makes those outcomes worse. And so I think we have to start from that fundamental premise that this is a absolute last resort. And until we understand and think of it that way, we will continue to overuse it. Um, and this is true not only in Philadelphia as, as Richard pointed out in his introduction, but this is true in every state across the nation that is struggling with this problem. So truth number two, and this I hope we can also all agree on, which is that the majority of cases we're talking about are neglect. These are not cases of severe physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. 
And I'm going to ask you to take my comments in the context that the majority of cases we are talking about have to deal with neglect. And neglect, both in my experience and my research, are really a proxy for poverty. And what we are talking about are issues of housing, lack of access to mental health services, lack of access to meaningful individualized substance abuse programs that are family-based, that are attachment-based, lack of access to stable housing and education supports, and lack of access to employment supports, and really everything that we all want for our own families and our own life, which is a stable place and community and within which to live. So if the majority of cases are neglect, and that whenever you're ready, when you just, get just, a, just a reminder for people to mute your microphone so we don't accidentally hear your conversation. Uh, you know, we'll 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 proceed. I'm sorry, Professor Fink. Would that's, you continue? No, no, no. That's okay. Um, but if we think about the premise that the majority of cases neglect, then I think where that leads us to is how, as a community as a city council, as a city, and as a nation, we need to start to think about how we prioritize thinking about poverty and families. Because as it is currently structured, the child welfare system and DHS are not meant to be anti-poverty programs. They are not meant to address the very concrete, tangible needs that bring children and families into contact with the child welfare system in the first place. And so we need to reconceptualize how we prioritize family integrity and family support through funding, services, training, and the implementation of our laws that children are removed only when there is no alternative way for them to stay safely in their parents' care. Our focus should always be, and the law clearly states that this is what the focus should be, that children remain in their parents' care whenever possible and are returned as quickly as possible if it is unsafe to do that for some period of time. So I wanna pause it. my proposal then is that there are three there are two ways that we can do this and two ways that i would urge the council to think about especially in light of some of the recent developments at the federal level and switches and funding of which i am no expert and i do not pretend in any way to provide guidance to the council on how to utilize those funds i simply know they exist and so i want to make sure that we can think about these not solely as pie in the sky academic theories about what we could do, but things that have been implemented in other similar jurisdictions and are possible here in Philadelphia. So let me start with the first one, which is preventive legal services. And again, I would encourage you to look at some of the recent guidance from the Administration for Children and Families, which uh, recently, actually as of January 12th, 2021, issued a memorandum about civil legal advocacy to promote child and family well-being and to address the social determinants of health and enhance community resilience. And what this is doing, and yes, you may say, well, of course, as a lawyer, I am putting myself at the center of this discussion and I am asking you to increase legal services. But what I really think we're doing is looking at the issues that bring folks and families into contact with the child welfare system in a different manner. We're thinking about issues of housing, mental health access, employment stability, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, that all have legal remedies. And absent an early intervention to address those issues as a legal issue and not an issue for the child protection system, we are putting children into foster care that could have otherwise been prevented from doing so. I'm reminded of my colleague Vivek Sankaran and Chris Church out of the University of South Carolina and the University of Michigan who did a study of children who were removed and stayed for less than 30 days. And of course, when I hear that, my initial instinct is to say, why were they removed at all? Why were they put in a different setting and that trauma, as we talked about as truth number one, was ever attached to these children? And what could we have done differently? So one of the things when we think about an alternative to removal and we think about re-envisioning the foster care system is to look at preventive legal services that actually attack that subset of cases, which again, I will argue are the majority of cases that have to do ne with neglect. Because when you go into DHS, they don't have the capacity to give a parent stable housing. They don't have the capacity to give a parent a job or concrete tangible supports that are needed to stabilize and support families. Now we can talk about funding those programs. We can talk about looking at more community-based supports, but at heart, what I want us to be thinking about is that prevention 
is absolutely an alternative to removal. And the more we think about in terms that in terms of preventive legal services, as well as supportive service in the community, then I think we will have a broader understanding and impact on the needs that at least I have seen in my own experience. I'm going to talk about two different programs that I think would be helpful in sort of trying to understand how this might even work in practice. So one is a medical legal partnership program that we have been doing and also community legal services with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And the goal is to think about how legal intervention can address the social determinants of health. And the social determinants of health, for those of you not familiar with that term, is essentially all of the facets of where you live and where you go to school that impact your health. We know from all the research that it is more determinative where a child lives at their zip code of what their outcomes will be than anything else. And we know that if a child lives in poor housing, where the landlord is not making repairs to the heating, that their asthma is going to be exacerbated. So that legal issue of a landlord's failure to make what are repairs mandated by the lease leads into a health issue for that child of their asthma being exacerbated. And then perhaps having to go to the ER, a parent having to take off from work, and you see how that very fragile position starts to crumble apart and families are not supported. The medical legal partnership model, which has been in around the country for about 20 years and began at a Boston, um, Boston Children's, Dr. Barry Zuckerman, who piloted it there, the model essentially states to integrate legal services into the care team delivery at a pediatric clinic or a hospital or a local federally qualified health center, whatever the case may be. And to screen for the variety of civil legal needs, such as income, housing, employment, legal status, and partner violence that have an impact on a family's stability, and I would argue are the precursors to what we ultimately see in the child welfare system as neglect. And so having that intervention not only placed at a moment where there may not be a crisis, right, where the eviction notice, notice hasn't been posted or the benefits haven't been completely turned off, is the key. Additionally, having it be a warm handoff. Caseworkers struggle all the time valiantly to create, create relationships with their parents and with the families that are not ones based on threats. But at the end of the day, the caseworker has the power and the state action to remove a child from their parents' care and everybody knows it. Using the medical model where there are trusted relationships, hopefully with the nurses, with the doctors, with the hospital social work staff to make that warm handoff to a lawyer to address again, what those underlying issues may be. Ultimately, not only I would argue helps improve the child's health, but their access to services and supports and ultimately remaining outside of the child welfare system. The other program is thinking about whether or not prevent preventative legal services during an investigation are helpful. And I would argue based on my experience in the Bronx that they in fact are. And I know that everyone will go, but that's more lawyers, that makes things more complicated, that makes things more adversarial and litigious. And my, my whole sort of, career has been to show that in fact, what lawyers do is marshal information to help the people who have to make the decision make one that ultimately is in the best interest of the family. And what I mean by that is, is so often we are working at very small pieces of data and very sort of finite or snapshot pieces of information about a family. And having a legal team that the parent can trust involved during an investigation can be critical to showing not only the totality of the family circumstances, the history beyond that one moment that may have caused the report, and more importantly, to think more broadly and expansively about how the agency responds. Ultimately, we have an adversarial system and we have due process for parents because we want to hold agencies accountable. That is not something that I think should go away. I think holding government agencies accountable is important. I think it's something, again, that maybe I'll add as my truth number three. But the role of the attorney and the legal team having that constant trust with the parent during an investigation has been shown to actually decrease the number of children, not only removed, but even brought into the court system in the first place. And I would direct your attention to programs that are 
happening that have happened both at the Detroit Center for Family Advocacy in Seattle and now new models that are happening in East Bay um, and New York City as well. Preventive legal services don't muck up the process. They actually help the process run more smoothly to get to an answer for how to support and serve a family that very well may be in need. The second proposal I want to put forward is one that, well, I know the committee is also looking at the front end and how cases are brought in and representation, excuse me, reporting. I want to look at the end that I've, you know, sort of had my experiences, which is once you get into court, and as I've said to my clients on multiple occasions, once you're in court, you're 10 steps behind the ball. We have to play catch up and we have to think about all the things that led to this place. And I will say, without any qualification, with almost every single case, even cases where I may agree a child need to be removed for some portion of time, there was always a missed point of intervention in that family's life when you took the time to find out what had happened and how they had landed into family court. But once you are in family court, I want to argue that parental representation is key. And having a robust interdisciplinary parent representation team in family court is key not only to the functioning of the family court, but also to the proper and accountable functioning of DHS. And I think this is not, again, just simply my opinion. I think what we've seen is that it's borne out in the literature and the studies, which to be fair are new and have just started. And clearly we need to have a more robust study of this but again, is also borne out in the federal government and their willingness to fund this now. So what we know from, from the Administration for Children and Families and the Children Bureau is that they have actually rethought, and here I look to the words of Jerry Milner, who was the, the commissioner for the Children's Bureau, they have rethought how you represent parents and how important it is to represent parents in that process and to do so in a really sort of robust defense and interdisciplinary model. And what that means in practice is that every parent is entitled to a lawyer who will investigate their case, who will help them navigate the decisions, and a social worker who will do an individualized assessment of their needs, the supports, and a parent advocate who may be someone with lived experience in the system, again, who will help navigate what is an incredibly complex and overwhelming system. As many of you may know, when a family enters the child welfare system, there are numbers of processes that happen from the family court case to the meetings with the foster care agency, to the family team conferences with DHS and other participants and allowing a parent to understand not only their rights, but their responsibilities during that practice, during that process is critical. And what we see from the research mostly done most recently by Professor Marty Guggenheim and Tim Ross um, out of New York is that again, enhanced legal representation and lawyers do not slow the system down do not mean that children are going, to, going back to unsafe homes. In fact, what it means is that decisions about permanency, whether that permanency is reunification or some other custodial arrangement, happen more quickly. And that is research that has also been suggested out of the Seattle office of the public defender there where they represent parents and thinking again more, tr more less traditionally about the role of lawyers in this process. Because the fact is, is that the work in family court is a small, small piece of a child welfare case. And having a legal team that is supporting a parent to understand what brought them into that system in the first place, how to address it, and how to think more creatively about what it means to make reasonable efforts, not only to prevent a child from going into care as the law states, but also as the law states to keep that child from ever coming into care in the first place. And so I propose these sort of two examples of preventive legal services and enhanced parental representation as ways at which we can start to get at this issue of removal at two different decision making points. And with that, I will end and open this up to any questions that that the members may have. And take Thank a drink. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor uh, Fink. I will <clears throat> let uh, Richard Wechlinger begin the questioning. However, I just want to note that um, our committee mem member Yolanda Bryant uh, is um, on the on the in the meeting with us. She had difficulty uh, technical difficulty signing in. She is with us. So, with that, uh, Richard Wechsler, would you like to begin the questioning? 
Thank you very much. Um, in talking about things like the medical legal partnership, one of the things I'm struck by is you talked about that kind of warm handoff to somebody who can help the family. How do you get around the fact that the people who would be making that handoff might also be saying, yes, but I'm a mandated reporter. I have to call Childline. It's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, one of the, and this, this has not been studied, but it's something that I am sort of, I think needs to be looked into more. And, and many of the folks in the pediatric MLP community are thinking about is understanding if DHS is seen and or child welfare generally is seen as the only response to a family's needs, then we're going to end up using removal more often. As opposed to understanding that an issue of safe housing is not in and of itself a maltreatment or a neglect issue. But if there's nowhere else for that social worker or that doctor or that nurse to turn to to provide support, then yes, that's when inevitably it happens. There's a study out of, um, I believe, Ohio, I might be wrong on that, that was done with doctors about why they fail to ask questions about whether there are issues going on in the home. And the biggest reason was not a misunderstanding, not a failure to care about the family, not a failure to think that they want to intervene or provide support, but that they wouldn't know what to do with the answer. And they wouldn't know what to do if a family member said, yes, I'm struggling with my housing. I'm struggling with my job. I'm struggling with the amount of food that's coming in. And I think if we look at basic public health philosophy, we want to be encouraging families to share their struggles, to share when they need help, and to have community-based models that achieve that, as opposed to creating a system where folks are keeping that information inside from both doctors or anyone else in the system because they have a fear. I do think that the more that MLPs are utilized and the sort of wraparound training that happens to realize actually that's a housing issue, that's not a neglect issue, um, can go a long way in reframing how everyone thinks about reasonable cause to suspect maltreatment. Okay, I was actually thinking of something else, but related, oh. which is, no, 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 so that's, that's a very important piece of it. The other piece I was thinking of is the professional who knows full well that the call isn't going to do any good and that's not the way to go, but says, I'm afraid to do otherwise. They'll get me for it. Yeah, and I don't know that I'm the best person to speak to that. I do think it would be interesting for the the committee to speak to folks on the ground who are sort of make, working in, for example, clinics in West Philadelphia where the vast majority of families coming in are families who may, for various reasons of socioeconomic and racial status, may be coming into more contact with the child welfare system to think about what are the constraints that you feel and how is this being interpreted? Part of that inevitably goes back to what is the training for you know, large scale, either medical institutions or schools or child welfare agencies, what is the training that goes into explaining what exactly rises to the level of a report as well? Well, I have to tell you, I took the mandated reporter training for Pennsylvania mandated reporters to find at least one of the courses. And I must tell you, it was deeply, it was a deeply disturbing, although not unexpected experience. Because when you look at that training, they will tell you gut feeling or use your feelings are some of the things that are that are in there. Now, is there anything in the state law definition of reasonable cause to suspect that includes um, feelings or gut instinct? No, not to my knowledge. Um, no, I, I think, you know, what I'm reminded of are, are two things. I think one one is and, and I'm by no means an expert in this work and I would defer to my my colleague Professor Roberts, Dorothy Roberts at the law school, right? Whenever we're dealing with gut instincts, we are more likely to go into biases and stereotypes and preconceptions, which, um, you know, obviously the child welfare system, not only in Philadelphia, but nationally has, has struggled with forever. I think the other thing I would go to is there, there was a famous case in that really sort of seminally shifted the practice when I was practicing in New York called Nicholson v. Scapetta. And what they said and what the Court of Appeals, the highest court in, in New York said was essentially just that, Richard, right? You are not supposed to be making these decisions based on your gut. 
This is not supposed to be a safer course analysis of how you whether or not you remove a child because again to go to truth one the reality is and the court acknowledged this in in that decision the reality is is that the removal will be traumatic and so you need to weigh whether that removal is more traumatic or is is not than keeping the child in the home with supports and is actually more problematic and so i would argue we, we never want to be going on our guts um and we want to be having some real clear both i think metrics and procedures for how you make those decisions so since gut instinct is not actually in the definition of reasonable cause to suspect nor is feelings presumably Philadelphia DHS could add to any training that it provides to mandated reporters um, some alternative way to understand reasonable cause to suspect. Could they not? I don't. I don't see any reason why that couldn't. And I think also, if you were to look at some of the some of the other models across the nation and particularly looking at sort of differential response programs where again the response is not to go immediately to a report or a removal um, but to think about services i think that could also be certainly implemented okay one last thing and then i will wrap up for this because i definitely want to hear the other panel and i know there are plenty of other people who want to get in questions just want to add in terms of the legal representation model. As you mentioned, there is the exhaustive study out of New York showing it reduces time in foster care with no compromise of child safety. There have been other studies in other parts of the country on this, and the federal government in eligible cases will now pick up 50% of the tab. My understanding is one Philadelphia courtroom is now following this model um, as part of the state's family engagement initiative. So I would think I don't see anything that would stand in the way of DHS on its own saying, let's make it 100% of the cases instead of one courtroom. I, I see no reason. We certainly had tremendous success in the Bronx where we ultimately were representing, I believe, close to 85% of the parents who came in through the system. Um, and again, I think what ultimately happened is that the judges were receptive and happy because they were getting the information they needed to make informed and counseled decisions. The child advocates were also able to talk with attorneys and not be sort of solely responsible. And I think ultimately it, it shifted the practice to one that protected the due process rights of parents, the rights of children to have their voices represented and for their needs to be met and for courts to really hold not all parties accountable and then make reasonable, well-informed decisions and ultimately move to more quickly bringing children back into their parents' care. Thank you very much. I do have more, but I will wait. And if there's time after the next panel and after the other members uh, ask their questions, we can come back, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Wexler. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Fink. I will just, um, you know, uh, let um, the other committee members know and, and the public as well that uh, I did speak with the head of training uh, of social workers at Children's Hospital and the executive vice president who told me that they train everyone in the hospital to use their gut instincts. Um, so with that information, I went to the Philadelphia uh, uh, DHS commissioner to tell her, I think we need to do something. And she told me that is absolutely the law that people use gut instincts, which is what led to the hearing. Um, and I will just say to the public, there is no legal standard called gut instinct. Anytime someone uses a gut instinct, they are violating the Constitution. You can use gut instincts to to alert yourself, uh, to to um, build like what you want. You cannot deny someone something because you have gut instincts. There's no legal standard. I will say the end result has been a very discriminatory system that punishes the poor and those perceived to be weak and in Philadelphia, a just a, a tremendous violation of the rights 
of African American women and Hispanic women and poor white women, but overwhelmingly for the same exact issue, um, there is tremendously different treatment. We have seen publicly that when someone, for example, leaves a child by accident in their car, they lose that child to DHS and maybe for good reason or maybe not. But depending on your race and social economic background, we have also seen that nothing happens. And, and I'm not saying that children should be taken away for the mistake of whatever's going on. As, as you said, it's traumatic. But I think that the disparity in treatment is very problematic. A lot of what I have to deal with regarding this issue are people, sometimes parents, sometimes grandparents, and sometimes professional people like teachers or vice principals or other people who acted in a manner that that seems very responsible. My child fell off the bike. I took my daughter to the hospital. Lo and behold, that was three years ago. It's unbelievable that children are removed with no evidence of any wrongdoing and have to fight a system that appears to look at adults as the enemy to be scrutinized and questioned when they have presented evidence of a mere accident or or they have taken a child into the hospital. It is astounding to me that we have to fight this. So uh, I will say that that uh, I, I really appreciate your insights and the solutions, your legal acumen. I, I will also say that um, we have a system that superficially seems to address some of the issues you raised, Professor, but many people on our committee and 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 who have complained uh, reveal a system where they don't actually have legal representation. They have the illusion of legal representation being that their attorneys are paid so little money they have no incentive to delve into these cases and have a lot of incentives not to argue with the judges, argue with the with the with DHS and the social workers. And that to me is, you know, something what where our government continues to create all kinds of categories of free legal services that are very, very poor legal services. It's the illusion of legal services. To me, it's a big problem. Um, so with that, I will just say, if anyone else on the committee has a question for Professor Fink, uh, please um, send me uh, a note in the chat. Or if you don't, if you're having trouble, just speak up and say you have a question. I will give it a, a few seconds and, and then move on to our second panel. Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to uh, uh, introduce our second panel. The second panel is going to be Pat Albright, Celine Kamen, and Carolyn Hill. They are all from a group called DHS Give Us Back Our Children. Um, would the three of you in that order, um, Pat Albright, Celine Kamen, Carolyn Hill, introduce yourselves to let us know you are connected and ready to testify. Yes, now I've unmuted myself. I'm Pat Albright um, and, uh, with the Every Mother's Working Mother Network and DHS Give Us Back Our Children. Um, thank, so thank you ready. for being here. Mm -hmm. Celine Kamen, are you on? I am uh, Celine Kamen uh, with the same, same groups and I seem to be well connected here. Very good. And then finally, Carolyn Hill, are you connected? Um, I'm Carolyn Hill. I'm here with Every Mother's a Working Mother and DHS. Give us back our children. Okay. With that, I will ask you to um, state your name and give us your testimonies. Uh, we'll start with Miss Albright to Miss Kamen and, and with Miss Hill. 
Uh, I'd like to request that the, if, if Celine came in, could possibly go first. That's we, perfectly fine. Okay, Celine, thank you. Came in, would you start us off? Sure, thank you. We sort of arranged our little talks to kind of go in this order. <laughs> Very good. For, for doing that. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Celine Kamen of Every Mother is a Working Mother's Network. Uh, I also organize with DHS Give Us Back Our Children, a collective self-help advocacy group that we formed in 2006, along with two mothers who are holding a weekly demonstration outside of Philadelphia Department of Human Services to protest the unjust removal of their children. Um, I, I want to thank Richard uh, and David for inviting us and forming this commission and uh, Professor Kara Fink for her work representing pan parents and solutions on preventive measures for keeping more children out of the system. Um, however, I'm here before you from a very different perspective, but I hope a useful one. As a low income single mother myself, with two other low-income single moms, uh, one who has had uh, some experience uh, dealing with the department. Uh, and we very strongly want to frame this by saying, we feel it's time for Philadelphia to give priority to the crisis of, of mothers and children's poverty. Uh, we feel it's time to take the money that's being used to remove children and pay it directly to the mothers for the work that we're doing for caring for children. Struggling mothers and children need to be helped, not blamed and punished by family separation. And I'm going to explain to you, too, if this sounds, you know, idealistic or whatever as we go down. And that's why Pat's going to go last, because she's going to actually really go into some detail on some measures and, and legislation that's even being put into place right now that will do this. Anyhow, but I'm going to continue uh, to kind of lay it out. So as we know, poverty is tearing our families apart in Philadelphia. And, it, and it's way worse for black, brown, indigenous, and other mothers of color, and those of us with disabilities whose income is driven down and who are targeted because of racism, ableism, and other discrimination. As survivors of domestic violence, we know that if we only had money and housing, we could take ourselves and our children away from our abusers. Instead, our lack of having any cash at hand gives us no options. And we are afraid even to report the abuse we receive because DHS punishes the victims and takes our children. This is a gigantic piece of the problem, um, which I think doesn't get noted enough. We think doesn't get noted enough. As we see, see come through our grassroots organization, so many mothers who have their children taken uh, because of this issue. Uh, and it's also the reason why we are, are demanding, I'm sorry, I have a noisy bird, Polly, shh. <laughs> um, the reason this is, could you give him some, a nut? thank you. <laughs> the the bird is okay, just keep going, thank you. <laughs> uh, and this is the reason that that when we're looking at these things, we're demanding that the money goes directly to us mothers, not to the head of the household, who is often the abuser, not necessarily into you know a program, um, but actually having money go to the mothers because when money goes to the mothers, the children eat and they are cared for. And in these domestic violence situations, um, you know, the mother and children are able to uh, get into a, a, a safe situation. So as Pat, Carolyn, and I speak to you today, 
you will hear our frustration over some of this, I think, because we've been here before um, saying this so many times over and over again for years and, and with many others who are among us here in this hearing today, uh, as well as the mothers that are standing and speaking outside of family court presently demanding justice for themselves and their children and those that are here that are working to guarantee housing, because uh, as Kara and everyone has said, you know, many children would not be taken if only their mother had had housing. Um, but yet after all this uh, campaigning and, and, and talking that we've done and, and we're still poor and we're still struggling. So, we really feel poverty is at the root of this and uh, it's what's causing our children to be traumatized and, and sold away to strangers. Um, you know, there's also no question as has been brought up here that the child welfare system, you know, has an underlying white supremacy, which is formed historically from the separating of families uh, of black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color and capitalizing off of their bodies. As Dorothy Roberts wrote in her introduction to Shattered Bonds, the color of America's child welfare system is the reason Americans have tolerated its destructiveness. You know, and, and this is why this mandatory reporting thing is especially worrisome, I think, because, you know, we have all these underlying biases that, uh, you know, not only in the child welfare system, but in, you know, in general in our communities. So, um, you know, for that reason, uh, among others, we join the movement for black lives uh, and their demands for the same level of funding to care for our own children that foster parents receive and for an end to the irreversible termination of our parental rights. We call for the money child welfare spends to go directly to the mothers and other primary caregivers for the work of raising children. The COVID pandem pandemic has shown a light that caregivers, including unwaged, are essential workers. The whole society depends on our caring work yet we get the least in relief, stimulus, or ongoing financial supports. Increasingly, demands are being made to compensate unpaid caregivers, thereby strengthening the movement against child removal. We strongly urge this committee to work to help implement the city's poverty action plan, which Pat will go into more details about uh, after Carolyn also relates um, her personal story with DHS and the experiences of the other moms that she has organized with. Um, just briefly, and Pat will go into this more, some other measures that we're supporting, some of them are international and federal, but which can have impact on Philadelphia and maybe also uh, be used as guidelines for other things that we can do here. Um, one is um, we, we're very, glad to see that part of the Biden COVID relief package has something that uh, is similar to something we've been calling for for a long time, which is a child benefit, which guarantees a basic payment for the care of children, um, as they have in many other in Canada, Australia, and almost every other EU country. Um, we support expanded fully refundable child tax credits as part of this Biden uh, COVID relief package, which means that fully refundable, if people don't know, means that it's not, it's not dependent on your income. You don't even have to make any income. You still are going to get this money. Um, and the money, again, we're very concerned, must go directly to the mothers or primary care givers and also must not get deducted for past debts or reduce other assistance families uh, receive. And, and that's a little issue with, with that, um, that is it going to go directly to the mothers or who's going to get that money, but, but, but we're glad to see it. Another thing that we're looking at is the, uh, and supporting and, and have been uh, working with the representative 
quite a bit is the Worker Relief and Credit Reform Act, which was proposed by Representatives Gwen Moore and Marsha Fudge. It redefines work to include unpaid caregivers and students in the earned income tax. So it even broadens it from mothers to also uh, many other caregivers in our community. Um, we also support a care income for people and the planet, which was put forward in the Green New Deal for Europe and supported by the global women's strike. Uh, this care income would pay people like mothers for the work that they do. Um, yeah. Uh, for caring for, you know, a, a wide range of unwage caregiving that we do. And, and the last thing is uh, we support the Poor People's Moral Justice Jubilee Platform, uh, to which we contributed. And it calls to, quote, prohibit the use of any funds allocated toward welfare spending to go towards family separation or child removal. And that's the end of my introduction, uh, Carolyn, uh, is next. All right, thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, give a note uh, that um, because we are televised, we have uh, some limitations on us. It is my job to make sure that we move along within our you know, uh, time period. You're doing fine and uh, we will not ask questions until after this entire panel has testified, but just keep in mind uh, that we do have a limitation on time and we will have additional um, a testimony, uh, I can see from four, maybe five other people who are making public comment. So with that, let me just ask, um, I believe Ms. Hill to go next. Hi everybody, my name is Carolyn Hill. I had experience with DHS back in 2011 when they put two nieces of mine in my home and then we moved them 2012, a week before Easter in 2012 of April. And for no reason, <clears throat> they removed the kids. They didn't even tell me what, what did I do wrong or anything. They just told me to be the court. So in the process of me being the court, I had no lawyer. I didn't know where to get a lawyer from. So I went to the news, Philadelphia newspaper. And it was, they sent me to Crossroads. They gave me the number to Crossroads Women's Center which I called them and they decided to help. They did not decide, they did help me with my case, supporting me, having, um, pro you know, protesting in front of DHS and fighting my case because DHS had told me I wasn't able to get a lawyer. So I would have to find my own lawyer. And this is how they screwed me. They, they took the kids, they gave me a court date. They tell me to come in. I go in. The judge tells me, do not speak on nothing you hear in this courtroom. So they're sitting up there telling the judge I'm being evicted. I got mental issues, which I didn't have a GED. They said I didn't have. That was the only thing that was true. But all the rest of it, the, they said I was being evicted. And um, all that did was, pack of, was lies, which I couldn't speak on to this judge. So no one, when they said I was being evicted, I figured, yeah, they're going to take the kids because I'm being evicted, which I was not being evicted. What they had did, they went to, I'm on Section 8. They went to Section 8. Section 8 needed me to get a birth certificate and Social Security, what I told um, the worker. Oh, instead of her giving me that, she goes to Section 8. Section 8 tells her, if I don't turn these papers in, that I will be evicted. But they never gave me the papers. They removed the kids. And then from there, I went to court with no ju no lawyer. Then come to find out at the end of the whole court, I went all the way up to the superior court with this. And um, and DHS give us back our children organization, help me out with everything, paperwork, delivering the mail, making sure they get their packages and everything. Then at the end, they said I was able to get a lawyer. But I had got a pro bono. It took me a year to get a pro bono lawyer who I had got. And and then they still railroaded me because they brought up stuff that they already knew in 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 my history before they even gave me the kid. Then they sat there and said I had a child abuse. And I asked them, where's this child abuse record at? Go get it. Bring it to court. They didn't do that. 
they gave me an evaluation trying to say that I wasn't fit enough to um, take care of kids. The lady did evaluation for one day, told me I was on a fourth grade read, read level. So then I had another evaluation that DHS paid for, and that took seven days where he told them that I was capable of taking care of these children, my nieces. And um, they just put me through a whole lot. Of every time I came up with something, they changed it. You know, then when I find out that the reason why they didn't ever give me the kids back is because I went and seek the help from DHS Give Us Back to Our Children organization, and they didn't like that. Now, the people that they gave the kids to, or they owned their house and stuff, I was in low income housing on disability. But the, the ones that they gave the kids to right now, today, they are even, they not even together. They was married. They set up in the courts, held hands, and the judges and the lawyers knew that they were just out for the money. That's how I put it. Because right now today they ain't been together. They married, but they ain't been together since they got some kids that adopted them. I haven't seen my nieces since 2013. And um how I feel that it was it was wrong the way DHS did me because I called myself doing them a favor. They asked me to take the kids. I said yes. Then one then one of the um child advocates came out to see the kids and said, Oh, this is the happiest I ever seen this little girl. And then turn around and remove her from my home. So when she was so happy, why would you remove her? This is to terrorize and put all this here uh uh anger in these kids so that they can medicate these kids. And this is the first thing they do. You put them in a home that they love so well, they remove them. They remove them from a good home and put them in a bad home and then say the child got problems. No, the child know where they wanted to be at. They, they, they loved it, me. They didn't want to leave me. They didn't even know the family member that they went with. The family member didn't know them. And I just want to say that I, I'm still looking to see my nieces that I haven't seen. They like nine, they 10 and 11 now. But um, it's the way that they did, how they did it. They didn't even give me a reason for taking the kids. They came in my home. They said I didn't have toys for the kids. I had toys for them kids. But DHS look at your house. If it ain't clean, they're going to remove your kids. So I made sure the house was clean when they came. And the toy, they had all the toys they wanted. They had everything. I did not neglect near one of them children. I was good to my nieces. They loved me and everything. They was, one of them was put in two different foster homes. They were Spanish. One cut her hair. The other one went and took her to the barber and got it trimmed down even more. I grew my niece hair back and everything. I don't, to today, I still don't know why they took my nieces from me when I was doing good with them. I had no right. problem. I took them to their doctor's appointment, their clinic appointment. It, 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 it was it just, the way they got in court, it just lied on me, whereas though I couldn't speak for myself. Then they did it all the way up at the Superior Court. Talk about I smacked my oldest granddaughter, punched in the eye, did all of that, and got a child abuse record. I said, where is it? Show it to me. They couldn't show it to me. The three lawyers got together. I was supposed to have uh, witnesses come to court. They stopped all the witnesses from coming to court. They, all right. sabotaged. they did I'm, all that. I'm sorry to interrupt, Ms. Hill. Your testimony is important. We do have it. And I can mm -hmm. tell you, we have. And can uh, I say, can I say something yes, else? I have sure. friends. I have friends in here. I have a friend that friend with my daughter. She has seven kids. She went to DHS for help, and they took took all her kids and separated them. Now she out here, you know, like mind lost, whatever, because she can't get her kids back. She don't know how to fight to get the kids back. And then you got a lot of them out here don't want to let, they want help, but they scared it because DHS will take your children. They will take, I mean, they coming to you for help. Why would you take them instead of helping them? If they need housing, get them a house. They used to do that. They don't do it no more. They tell you they're going to get you a house, but they don't. They have you thinking they're going to help you all kinds of ways. And the whole time they're planning on keeping your kids and giving them to somebody else. 
All right, thank, thank you very much, Ms. Hill. I just want to explain to everybody that at our first hearing, we had uh, 58 um, mostly mothers give public testimony um, until we had to stop the hearing because the stenographer could not continue physically with that length of you know hearings. We picked it up at another time. We have heard um, literally hundreds of testimony like yours from all different types of people. I don't want to minimize what you're saying. I'm just simply saying that because of the uh, the pain and the hurt and the trauma and everything else. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, people affected by this can really start uh, and go on for quite a long time um, because of the limitation of this hearing and because we have to get to recommendations. Um, your testimony is very important, but I'm going to ask everyone to try to stay within the time limit so we can get everyone's testimony in. With that, I'll ask Ms. Albright uh, to conclude the testimony of this panel. Um, again, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to testify here. Um, uh, both uh, from Richard Wexler and Councilman O oh and Councilwoman Bass uh, and others. Um, and I'm a low income single mother myself with disabilities. Um, I, I raised my son on a very low income and I, mean, I had some fears myself and he, my son is now 29. He's black. And I thought, well, if I had also been black um, and um, uh, maybe I would have lost him as well. So it was, it was always a fear I had because I knew a little bit about the system and what could be happened to me. Um, and I was very glad to hear about uh, Kara Fink's program. Um, uh, but I, I agree with what uh, what um, Celine was saying is that, of course, and, and, and Carolyn as well, is that we also need cash. Um, and that um, so I wanted to to raise up the issue of, of the a city poverty action plan, which I think would be really good to, I mean, it seems like there's two different streams. What about uh, the city, this pro, this partnership taking place so that we can, for example, help implement things on their state wide agenda, state city state agenda, which is for example, increasing TANF benefits as a temporary assistance for needy families that has not been increased you know, really disgracefully since 1990. Um, and, and according to the, the, uh, the poverty plan, TANF currently serves as the primary income for almost 50,000 adults, mothers, they, they, you should say, mostly, and children in Philadelphia um, at $403 a month for a family of three, which is current benefit level. In addition, we should be demanding an end to work requirements and time limits. Um, as Coretta Scott King said, um, with some of the cuts and changes being proposed you know, with, uh, earlier on, she said it forces mothers to leave their children and accept work or training, leaving their children to grow up in the streets. So we want those work requirements and time limits to, to end. Uh, and that we should have the money on the basis of our, uh, the work that we do, the invaluable work and essential work we do as, as mothers and caregivers. Um, and we see what, Greta Scott King says, reflected today in the foster care to prison pipeline. And we see in DHS, as we're seeing too much in, in our society and other ways as well, the, the, the disregard of the, value, the, the critical nature of the bonding between mothers and children, or the primary caregiver and children, um, and how, um, how that impacts children the rest of their lives. Um, uh, and I wanted to also flag up that the state partnership agenda always also calls for restoring the general assistance, which is or the GA program, which actually I was on, uh, with higher monthly stipends over a longer period of time. So that um, is a lifeline, not only for people in my situation who was wait, trying to get on, waiting to be found eligible for disability benefits, which took a couple of years, which is normal, but unfortunately, um, but it also goes, would, it goes to caretakers for unrelated children, helping to keep them out of the foster care system. Um, and it also um, helps women for, to flee domestic violence situations. That's what that money um, would go for, has gone for in the past. So I want to flag that up. Um, and last year, there was a federal pandemic TANF Assistance Act, which would have increased benefits and ended work requirements and time limits. Um, and um, 
one of the co-chairs was Senator, well, the, a couple of the co-chairs included Senator Sherrod Brown and also Senator Kamala Harris, which is interesting to note. Um, and the, and, and uh, Sherrod Brown had this to say about the bill. The legislation appropriates $10 billion for coronavirus emergency assistance grants to help address their basic needs, prevent household emergencies like foreclosure, forfeiture, and termination of utilities, and uh, avoid children needing to be removed from their homes. So that's, he says that specifically in this federal legislation, unfortunately didn't pass. But we just learned yesterday um, that Congress, that, that yesterday, Congresswoman Gwen Moore, who was mentioned earlier with the Worker Relief and Credit Reform Act, who we've worked closely with and is a former welfare mother herself, um, she introduced the Poverty is Not Child Neglect Act, uh, legislation that will ban federal funds from being used to separate children from their parents solely due to poverty. And she wrote a, a statement ending with this critical moment makes this issue even more urgent, giving us an opportunity to reform our child welfare system to ensure families are not separated because of poverty and can stay together by connecting parents with the support they need. So, and I think this is a good lead uh, a way to move in the direction as, as again, we've been saying with poor care income to reshape society for what it should be about, which is care of people and the planet. Um, and uh, as, as we say in the Poor People's Campaign, take away our poverty, not our children. Thank you very much. Um, there may be questions, but what I'm going to do as I try to, to um, manage uh, the time here of such important uh, testimony, I'm going to at this time ask the clerk and and the, the um, and our technical people to allow public comment uh, because I think this um, all ties in and then we will open it up for questions. Okay, Councilman, I believe they are connected. Um, the first person on my list is Kaisha Lamb. Yes, I'm here. Oh, please state your name and provide us with your testimony. My name is Kaisha Lamb, and I'm, I'm going to start now. I took my four month old to Children's Hospital in Philadelphia on January 4th because he fell off the bed six days prior to that. I took him when I realized his arm wasn't moving like it normally does. When I got to the hospital, doctors looked at his arm and from what they could see, there was no bruises. It didn't look broke or anything. They gave my son Carson an x-ray. So the x-ray, they saw that it was broken. So the hospital did a full body x-ray and he saw that what they thought was a fracture in his femur bone. They told me that from that, they would have to call DHS and let them know what's going on. However, his arm could have been broken from the story that I told them. They then informed me they had to involve DHS because my son's fracture, fractured femur didn't go with the story that I had told them about him falling off the bed. They suspected abuse or neglect on my end. DHS told me that I was guilty until proven innocent. And um, my, investive, my DHS investigator, her name is Latoya McLeese, DHS then told me to bring my other son, his name is Carter, 16 months old, to the hospital to get an x-ray. I didn't want to because I was scared that DHS was going to try to keep my other son as well. Um, they told me that if I didn't get my son and um, have his father bring him to the hospital, that they was going to call the police and have them come to my home and force my child's father to bring my other son up to the hospital. Um, they brought my other son up to the hospital. They did an x-ray on him as well. His x-ray was fine. They said they would have to take another x-ray three weeks from January 4th to see if my son's femur looked any different. And um, DHS was supposed to get my babies to go with my brother. DHS, DHS said he had too many children. He has five children. He's also certified foster parent. So they went with their grandma. And uh, when DHS first went, However, now DHS is trying to say that there's domestic violence in my relationship because my child's father's mother 
gave false information to them about the dynamic of my relationship with my child's father. Um, DHS is now saying that there is a case of domestic violence, and that is why my children cannot be brought back home. But on all legal documents, they're stating that this is a possible neglect and abuse case. None of this has been mentioned. I asked them, are they allowed to keep information from myself and a child's father and not tell us what we're truly under investigation for? They told us, yes, they're allowed to do that. There's been no mention of domestic violence until January 22nd, the same date that the medical records came back in my my favor. Those been the, um, uh, also DHS talked to my younger siblings, which I currently have custody of, 14 and 12 years old, and they're still at home with me. They talked to them and they asked them things like, were they comfortable at home? Was there any abuse and things like that? And uh, my siblings told me that they told them what's going on here and they told them no. My other siblings, she also told me that the DHS worker asked her, does she like staying at my brother's house better than mine? Because I do have a smaller home, but everything in my home is provided, bed, food, everything in my home is provided. But DHS should not be trying to corrupt the children to say that they want to stay somewhere else just because it's simply bigger than that. Um, currently, right now, my court date is on February 16th, and um, now I'm supposedly going for a domestic abuse. When all documents state that this is about a situation that happened when my son fell off the bed and speculation of abuse and neglect. And now that it's proven that it's not that in my favor, now they're trying to find something else to pursue. And that's, that's all I have to say. All right, thank you very much. I will note for the record that I have, I have a copy of the medical records which were reviewed uh, by another doctor, both pediatricians who um, are uh, have expertise in child abuse, and it says there's no evidence of child abuse, consistent with falling off the bed. Again, this is a case of speculation, pure conjecture. There is no evidence of any abuse, and I am sure Parents walk in and out of the hospital with children who fell down. How is it that DHS decides to take this child and another child? And now that the medical report has shown no evidence of child abuse, keep the children and begin basically a witch hunt for possibly a domestic problem when there's absolutely no evidence of it and quite frankly, evidence that there is no domestic abuse at home. Anyway, I just wanna explain that I actually have read and reviewed the medical records as I have in many cases. Uh, it's just shocking to me. Um, all right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, clerk, would you read the name of the next witness? The next speaker is Vanessa Leary. We'll say that one more time and then we'll move on to the next witness if, if Vanessa Leary is not on the call. Ms. Leary, are you connected? Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, Jennifer Benich. Sorry, I'm here. I'm, I'm just at work. Oh, okay. Um, why don't you begin your testimony? Uh, we're, we're having a little difficulty hearing you. We're going to try to get your testimony. Mm, it's a different spot. Okay, All right. Um, I don't know where to start here, um, but I thank you for everybody's time. Um, well, uh, I, everybody knows my story already, and the only thing I can give or testify right now is a complete update of what uh, DHS and CUA is presently doing in my case. Um, we, my 15-year-old daughter is um, now in PLC, and because she's in PLC, um, what will, she became in PLC in March of last year before COVID hit. And during the time she was in COVID, um, her foster mom 
um, started neglecting my daughter's health. My daughter um, developed a severe form of IBS, and it got to the point where she was hospitalized for about two months. And while she was hospitalized, um, I contacted the foster parent, got nothing. Um, but apparently, the school worker was able to contact her, and... The reason why we did PLC is so the crew workers wouldn't be able to harass or contact us or our family any longer. And she was still contacting the foster mom. Um, I was still not able to get a hold of my daughter, and I didn't even know if she was... I didn't even know if my daughter was alive or dead. And I asked them to, if they can give me some kind of information Um stating if she was alive or dead because technically, um, because my daughter is a ward of the state, they don't have to tell you their um, living word has gone. Um, sorry. I didn't hear from my daughter. That was in June. I didn't hear from my daughter until October. Um, and that was when I made a plea to... Uh, the coup, the coup worker supervisor and filed a complaint against the coup worker who was still contacting the foster mom and she wasn't supposed to have any more um, contact with them. That's why we originally did the PLC and Judge Fernandez is the one that made the suggestion we do PLC to get Kua out of our case and DHS. And because I, I was told that because I agreed to do PLC, that now it left the door open for my rights to be terminated to my two boys that is now seven and three years old. And my daughter thinks it's her fault and because she wanted to do the PLC. And we all discussed it and thought it was a good idea. So she thinks. So she thinks it's just all completely her fault that this is going on. And they and they originally told her that for her not to worry about her brothers because they can pass for any race, so they're easily adoptable. And they falsified reports through my whole case. I have an investigation report which is completely falsified and. It's in my it's in my charts, it's in my records, and I don't understand how they can do this to a child. And it's not just a child that suffers; it's like the whole system that fails the child. And somehow people need to see this and understand that it it, it affects the child more than just mentally and and health wise. And I don't know what else to say. It's something needs to be done when it comes to this and our children that are in the system. You've said a lot, and I thank you for your testimony, your past testimony, your your involvement. It's not easy. It's terrible. I understand. We we are trying to do something. Uh, we're trying to do something productive and substantial. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, with that, I'll ask the clerk to read the name of the next witness. The next speaker is Jennifer Benich. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, my name is Jennifer Benich. I'm gonna give um, a little brief um, personal story, but I also just have some actual concrete recommendations for things with the Philadelphia DHS system. So my personal story is that in 2013, I tried to help another woman who lost her child for being homeless, get her child back by allowing them to come and reside in my home. The DHS worker on her case did not want to give her child back. So she filed a bunch of false reports regarding the condition of my home. And I was not aware that she had gotten a protective order. So I was stopped on Ridge Avenue and held at gunpoint by over 11 police officers 
to have my child removed from me. Um, no matter what I did, they would just keep lying about the condition of the property. And on, I, I ended up getting pregnant and hid my pregnancy. So on January 13th of 2015, DHS testified that my home was in deplorable conditions and I would have to move in order to get my son back. I went into labor on January 23rd, thankfully on a Friday and due to me hiding my pregnancy and not going to prenatal care, the hospital was required to call DHS, a worker unrelated to my case came out and approved my home um, and proved that the DHS was working, um, lying the whole time. They got mad. They sent out two supervisors and a public health nurse to try to get somebody to say that their reports had been true all along. I did get to keep my daughter and get my son back after that, but that was almost two years separated from my child and trauma that cannot really be lived down by either one of us. And DHS has also been used multiple times to retaliate against me for my um, protest activity in the city of Philadelphia regarding the Philadelphia Housing Authority. But I really wanted to just focus on some of the real issues with the DHS system itself. Um, one of the biggest issues is that DHS makes it available as a tool to be used as revenge. So you can just get mad at a person and you can just call DHS on them. And, and that's a thing that's thrown around in the neighborhoods. Like, oh, she wants to play with me. I'll call DHS on her. But according to 4906.1 of the Pennsylvania Crime Codes, false and malicious child abuse reports are a misdemeanor of the third degree, and they need to be treated as such. We need a, a task force. We need to enact a policy of confidential, not anonymous reporting, where people need to identify themselves with contact information so that if um, reports are determined to be malicious, they can be investigated and prosecuted because how else will things like that stop? It's just the same as gun violence or anything else. If there's no consequence, then people will continue to do it, especially when it's just a tool to just get revenge on people that you're upset with. And then the other issue is um, a lot of these social workers are not trained in the law and they don't understand the cultures of people that they are visiting at their homes and they make this very much more personal than professional. So under the law, I am permitted to deny a social worker access to my home and that social worker should file a motion to compel cooperation where they have to show the probable cause exists to, op to um, enter my home. If I don't let a social worker into my home, they should not create a personal beef with me and start going to great lengths to have my children removed. It is my right as an American citizen to ask you to put in this motion and present this evidence. It does not mean that I'm coming after you. You're here in your official capacity, not your personal capacity. And it does not mean that I have something to hide. It just means that I'm standing up for my rights and that I am protecting myself and, and my family, as well as when you are recording DHS social workers. That does not mean that you have a personal vendetta with them. It means that you're protecting yourself and your family and the general public um, just from government abuses. But a lot of these social workers take these things personally, just like people are trained at the hospitals to go on gut instinct. A lot of these social workers are going on gut instinct on how they're going to treat people's families and they don't understand the law. So they don't understand that you have a right to deny them access to your home. Um, so I, I just think that those are some of the things. And then the culture inside the courtroom, um, which is like because of the courtroom is being private, they're able to evade public review and, and there's no due process. Granted, in these courtrooms, you're never allowed to present your evidence. Whatever DHS says is just always considered as true. So I would really recommend um, some, some sort of policy being enacted or law where parents can choose to have the courtroom open and choose to bring people into the courtroom or have records unsealed because it's just, there's no open court and anything happens in these courtrooms. These judges are giving out gag orders. They're giving out orders not to record social workers against people's constitutional rights. And, and there's no way for any of this to be reviewed because your own family can't even come in the courtroom with you. You're just forced to sit in court alone and, and fight for your children when everybody in the courtroom is, is against you. And then also the child advocates who are supposed to be representing the children never even meet the children. They don't know your child. They don't know you. The first time they encounter your case is in a courtroom. So how can they make recommendations, you know, on um, what what should happen with you and your family? So I think that that also needs to change and maybe the age limits for how old children have to be to come and testify and say their own part in court. Right now they have to be 14. 
children under 14 should be able to come and speak in court and say how they feel about their home life or how they're being treated in foster care and um, other things like that. So that's all I really have to say for now. Thank you very much. You've kind of hit on uh, like every issue you talked about is an issue that is supported by experts. Um, so yes, everything you've said uh, is well within um, reforms advocated by data, uh, experience, and expertise. Um, uh, Clark, would you read the next uh, witness? Our final speaker is going to be Bridget Powell. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Bridget Powell and I have testified many times. I'm just going to update and give you um, synopsis of where I am. Um, I am actually a school nurse for 25 years and a Girl Scout leader for over 20. And I say that because my passion is truly children and families. Um, I'm a mandated reporter. I call DHS. But um, up until five years ago, I would have never believed any of this that we're talking about. Um, I still remember today, April 15, 2016, five years, almost five years ago, uh, my niece was removed from her, her mother's home and currently she is an orphan. DHS has terminated the parental rights of my um, niece and we're just waiting for our day in court. We filed our paperwork for adoption and in 2019, and I understand that COVID is now in existence, but it does not stop DHS from holding court hearings for cases that they choose to hear. Um, Wednesday, I was just at family court with another family, um, another um, family who was called into court. And all we keep hearing is, oh, they're backed up. My thing is, what happened to the process of a speedy trial? Um, my niece deserves permanency. And I'm just not understanding how DHS can just not follow the law and pick and choose which court cases to hear and which ones not to. Um, right now, the other law that they're not following is sibling separate, separation. Yes, my family has custody of her three siblings, but all she is allowed is two hours a month to see her brothers in a two by four room, which normally doesn't happen all the time. Um, we're fit and able relatives and they continue to ignore placing my niece with family. Um, another thing I've learned about was the family decision making meetings that are held and we had those also and KUA refuses to acknowledge the family decision making meeting document, which I'm told that is a legal document. Um, KUA is actually an agency that de definitely needs to be def um, defunded. Families are not getting the services that they're um, supposed to be providing. Um, KUA commits perjury under oath in the courtrooms. There's transcripts, there's evidence, and there's nothing done about the social workers who enter the courtrooms and lie under oath. Evidence is not required for DHS to take your children. Um, and then DHS also does not explore family members. In fact, in my family case, they told us family friend was equal to blood relative. Right now, um, I heard earlier that Kimberly Ali is admitting to some wrongs of DHS. Right, right about now, we just want her to right some of these wrongs and return some of these children that they have wrongfully um, taken. Um, they're, some of these children are in imminent danger, but still DHS continues to remove them. And in closing, I just need, need to find out how do we hold DHS accountable for the state laws that they're supposed to be following. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you very much. Clerk, is is that our um, final witness for public comment? It is, yep. Okay. Uh, with that, I will um, say before opening up for questioning by the committee members that um, the special committee that uh, we have formed uh, deals with the city and county of Philadelphia. Uh, we are making recommendations uh, to try to be a part of the solution to what we all see as problems. But a lot of this will have to happen in Harrisburg. I'm happy to say that it all it has already happened at the federal level, which was talked about today, the changing of incentives and funding now to keep families together 
as opposed to separate them. But that doesn't mean it happens right away. Uh, I do have a meeting um, at the state level, and uh, I think it is important the work that is being done by, by many people in our committee uh, at the state level and in connecting with, um, with other people around these, uh, these situations. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, start questioning by asking Richard Wexler if he has any questions for any of the witnesses who just testified. Okay, yes, just a couple, um, because several very interesting points I think were made during the witnesses' testimony. First, just two points I do, I do want to make. There was a lot of mention of what I like to call, as my favorite, the transformative power of cash. And just today, another study was released. This one from University of Washington researchers showing that you raise the earned income tax credit by 10%, you cut what authorities call child neglect by 9%. There has been study after study after study showing this. This is just one more. Also, to um, I think Ms. Kamen expressed some frustration about having an impact. I just want to say you are having an impact. The changes I mentioned at the outset are very small, but they never would have happened without you, without council members O and Bass to some extent without simply the formation of this committee. So you are having an impact. My questions, um, twice this came up interestingly among the witnesses, and that is the issue of handling domestic violence cases. Now the case of Nicholson versus Scapetta, which Professor Fink mentioned out of New York, was actually a case that dealt with that practice and which led to a settlement making it illegal in New York to take children from parents simply because the parents were themselves victims of domestic violence. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't still happen, but it happens less. And the reason for that was the overwhelming evidence on how harmful that is to children. It's even more harmful to take children in that way than under other circumstances. So my question, Ms. Kamen, is how often are you seeing cases like that in Philadelphia? Gosh, that, that's a good... That's a good question. And, you know, and uh, I'm going to, this is, well, I'm going to start with a non Philadelphia story just because it, it really made me think about how prevalent this must be. But I was at um, uh, a meeting uh, in Boston uh, with a judge there um, who, you know, just in conversation told me. Uh, I don't know how we got on the conversation. I guess I told her I worked with Every Mother is a Working Mother's Network and, and some of the stuff that I, I do with Give Us Back Our, did with Give Us Back Our Children. And uh, anyway, she said uh, the majority of, this was in Boston, the majority of the children she was separating from the mothers was because of domestic violence. And, you know, she was a retired judge. Um, yeah, so we uh, actually, I mean, we must, I, I would say, you know, Pat may have a better handle on it, but I'd say, you know, maybe close to three quarters of the calls we get in have some, you know, have that. Pat, maybe, Pat, are you still on? Pat, maybe has a better figure. You know, we need to look at this. And, and this yeah, is a yeah. problem too. Like I said, this judge, I said, well, you know, are you, did you ever do anything about it? Is there, did that, you know, and she said she felt really bad about it, but just like sort of went on with it. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have to ask for these figures. Um, if they're not coming out, that's one thing that the commission can do. Um, and I believe there's also, isn't there a study right now somewhere you might know about it richard but i think there's a study that that uh somebody is doing to put some of this together okay um question for ms benich do i understand correctly i was struck by this that the hospital in your case solely because you did not get prenatal care deemed that cause to call dhs is that correct Yes, that is correct. Okay, so in other words, we, so, so now people are put in a position where 
if they do get prenatal care, they may be afraid that the private, if they admit to something like, yes, I do smoke pot in order to make it easier to keep food down, for example, or maybe I did have an opiate problem and now I am taking a prescribed medication for it. If they go to a prenatal care provider, they have to be afraid that he's gonna turn them in. If they don't go to a prenatal care provider, now they have to be afraid the hospital is going to turn them in. Uh, is there anything in state law, which says lack of prenatal care constitutes reasonable cause to suspect child abuse or neglect? Not that I know of. I, I think they told me at the time that um, everybody was scared because of the new mandatory reporting laws because of Jerry Sandusky. So they were just calling DHS on everybody. Well, one of the areas I think we're gonna have to take a close look at is the whole intersection of the failed response to child abuse and allegations of substance abuse. So thank you. Last question, because this also came up twice. I've heard references to gag orders, to the fact that there is no accountability in the courtroom. In 43% of America's foster children live in states where these court hearings are open, um, because they include some of the largest states, New York, uh, Minnesota, Florida, Texas, and so on. Um, Professor Fink, what was your experience with that when you were handling cases in New York? And I will just say right now that um, the second time I ever walked into a courtroom was when Professor Fink showed me, uh, took me to a hearing in the Bronx. Uh, perhaps she's not with us. Professor Fink, are you still on the call? Okay, perhaps she's away she from, it. yes. Okay, well, what I what I can say is that um, there've been a number of lawyers who represent not only parents, but children in New York and elsewhere who have become converts to the idea of open court hearings. By the way, the first time I went and sat in on a juvenile court hearing that was open, it was at the invitation of Justice Max Baer when he was a judge of the juvenile court in Pittsburgh. I will just note um, that in her prior testimony, Professor Fink and, uh, and other expert witnesses, including a professor from NYU Law School, testified that uh, transforming the um, closed court system in New York to an open court system had a dramatically good effect on better treatment and better justice for children and others in New York. I will also uh, just state um, uh, that uh, one of the first times I actually had a sense that there was something wrong with DHS was when one of my uh, employees uh, who uh, was with me um, doing part-time work, uh, was in the hallway of City Hall talking to a, a DHS worker. And as it turned out, uh, because her, because she was a, a victim of domestic violence and because she was being chased physically uh, by him in the street, Ultimately, DHS came out and took her children, and and it appeared from every conversation uh, that I could hear from my desk, uh, and this was not on one occasion. The issue was that she was a bad mother for being the victim of domestic violence and exposing her children to the biological father who was a bad person, and so that's her fault. Regardless of what she was trying to do, regardless that he never hurt any of the uh, any child, did none of that, regardless it was uh, between him and her, the children were removed and she was to blame. Anyway, I, I just found that to be mind boggling. Uh, let me ask uh, the other committee members, does anyone else have any questions? or comments. Uh, you can say so or use the chat feature to let me know. 
I will finally ask because I've been getting text messages from our co-chair councilwoman Cindy Bass, if she is on the call, if she would like to make a closing statement. Well, good afternoon. Can you hear me, Councilman? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, well, th listen, I've been listening to the hearing and I've uh, been trying to tamper my outrage just a little bit um, <laughs> while, I've, while I've been in motion. But I have to say, um, you know, just some of the, the uh, well, not just some, all of the instances uh, are really just quite unacceptable. And it makes me wonder if any of these were white women from Chestnut Hill, would we even be having this conversation? And I think that we all know the answer to that. The answer is no, we wouldn't. There's a level of respect that will be give, given. Um, there's a le level of deference. There's a level of, uh, of, of assumption. Let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt um, that will be provided to some women versus other women, even when those same women may be in, uh, involved in, in relationships that involve domestic abuse. So um, I think that culturally, um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to be done to try to right these wrongs. Um, I heard one of the recent speakers say that uh, uh, DHS Commissioner Kimberly Ali was working on this and trying to fix some of the problems that exist within DHS. Um, I agree with uh, the, the uh, speaker who said that, you know, we need our kids back. That's how you fix this situation. As the mother of an 11 year old, I could only imagine the horror, the pain, the depression um, that I would go through if somebody removed my child from my care. I just cannot even fathom uh, what that would put me through. And at the same time, recognizing that poverty is a big part of what brings DHS into a family uh, purview, if you will. Um, one of the things I think we have to do is look at one of the suggestions by a, a caller early on, or a speaker early on, who talked about reallocating resources to families that are in poverty, that whose children are being removed, really because they are uh, living in poverty. And if we are able to do that, that there was a fund that would support families, particularly mothers uh, and, and caregivers. Let me just correct that. If we could have a fund for the caregiver of a child who is, uh, you know, t DHS is possibly thinking about removing from a home or possibly terminating rights, putting resources, financial resources, ensuring housing, ensuring uh, a quality standard of life, that could go a long way in fixing this problem. And I think it's something that we ought to be looking at. I think it's something that's, we're, we're, it's long past time that we have these conversations. Um, you know, one of the good things about the presidential election is that there was for the first time ever, the conversation around a minimum, a minimum basic income. And so I think that if we were able to put some resources behind these moms and behind these caregivers, it's going to go a long way. And so uh, I look forward to working with you, uh, Councilman, and all the other moms, all of the speakers who were here today, and all of the information that was provided. And one last thing was, um, you know, I know that Jennifer uh, Benetech, um, I know I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I'm, forgive me, Jennifer. Um, you know, Jennifer and I, we've had our, our share of ups and downs, um, you know, and, and she's been a very vocal critic of the system, and uh, she certainly is entitled to her opinion, and she's certainly entitled to tell her story and to make it be known that she's not going to be rolled over by the system. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate her story. Like I said, we don't always agree, but I think that she has every right to put her story out there and put folks on notice that certain behaviors are absolutely unacceptable and will not be tolerated, and she will bring them to light, as we will all work to do. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I am uh, humbled and honored to be in this hearing today and look forward to working with everyone. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, thank you for joining us despite the techno technology challenges and for your work early on supporting this issue. Uh, and, and I do believe as, as has been pointed out by Richard Wechter and others, we are picking up um, 
we are getting traction. We are moving forward. I will note that um, uh, our commission member, Yolanda Bryant, um, would want to uh, uh, say something, followed by a, a, a short statement by Keisha Lamb. Keisha Lamb. So, uh, Yolanda Bryant, could you um, can you join us? Hello. Hi. I just wanted to thank um, the guest speakers for, you know, um, their story, you know, telling their story. I, too, was a victim of VHS with, you know, my two grandchildren, three, and still fighting the system, you know, and I understand everything that they're going through and um, the pain that also comes along with it. Um, our constitutional rights definitely is a broken um all it's, it's like nothing even when um jennifer uh carolyn hill testified how she took good care of you know her grand her nieces and how um they still decide to just come inside and just remove her nieces you know with no justifiable rights um i understood and felt everything that she was saying and and even with jennifer and keisha and you know listening to vanessa larry um you know when you hear their stories it don't matter how many times that you hear this story because it's happening not only in philadelphia it's happening across the nation and it's something that definitely needs to be fixed and it's the the thing that some of the and our leaders because we you know we talked about the domestic violence part and you know it's ironic how they want to remove the children from the parents and families because of domestic violence and you know kimberly ali herself had experienced domestic violence where her husband you know was in the newspaper and to to think that they don't have the heart to understand you know um what's happening you know with other families and just use their gut feelings and just to place and make everyone the same, because everyone is not the same. There are some families that, that do need help more than others. But like um, the other speaker speaker has said earlier, you help the families, help them. You know, it's many ways that you can help them. And even the funding will help a lot. If you see a child, you go into a home, they don't have beds, they don't have food, but, you know, help them out. You don't have to remove the child from their home. And a lot of things that they do do, and I can say for sure, because I was a victim of it, how they lie and, and they use perjury. And at, at, at any cost, they will go to make sure these children is removed without court orders. And this has to be a change. It has to be a change. And I just wanted to thank the rest of the committee, um, you know, people for doing this hearing today. You know, it's last but it's a good hearing and it needs to be told because there's a lot of things that's happening in the DHS and to many families that's suffering that need to be told to the public that don't will never understand what's going on, you know, unless we continue to aware them of what's happening. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, finally, I want to say that basically um, we have committee members, um, and, and it is the end of our hearing. However, uh, one of our witness, Kaisha Lamb, did raise her hand, and I want to recognize you so you can make um, some comments before we conclude this hearing. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, neglected to mention a few things. Um, this isn't just affecting me or my child's father. Like this is also affecting my whole family. Like my sister, she's an honor roll student. Her teacher called me on January 13th, letting me know that she had logged out of class early and um, that she didn't finish the test. And he stated that this was on January 7th. And I told y'all the date that everything happened. This is all after my children was placed and taken out of our home. Like this is affecting us emotionally. I can't talk about it because if I talk about it, it'll be used against me. And this is this is just, it's ruined my life. And that's all I have to say, because this is a real family and those are real babies. And it, like, we're really going through this. And I can't believe they go home at night to their kids after they took mine away. 
Thank you for coming forward and for the public, I will say, listen, I would never have imagined this happens in America. I would never imagine, and and the mere fact, and, and there's so much to it as our commissioners and witnesses know, the mere fact that you even speak publicly about this is creates great anxiety of retribution from the system and that has been recorded and that has been said and we do know that happens. I'm happy to say that it doesn't always happen. I don't think it happens in most cases, but the ha- the fact it happens in any case, any case, there is a um there is a uh, uh, uh a chilling effect that people don't want to report health problems, poverty problems, domestic violence problems for fear of losing their children or not regaining them. It's just a a, a system in need of tremendous overhaul. Every child that is not uh, better off for being taken is being harmed. And many of us, myself included, believe that is why we have a staggering homicide rate in this city. Angry, angry people acting out because of the pain and anger. It is a huge problem affecting communities in our city in ways that we will one day fully understand. And uh, we need to really deal with this. I thank everyone on this committee. It's not easy to be on this committee. This work is very difficult and people need a solution yesterday. Some of the people, it's too late for a solution. Um, And I appreciate their participation. For those that are still fighting, um, I hope we can come up with something as soon as possible. With that, I'm going to end this hearing. Thank you very much. It is ended to the call of the co-chairs. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day and a blessed weekend.